Welcome and thank you for joining our Bible study in 1 Corinthians. Today we are reading chapter 11 verses 17 through 34 and is titled The Lord's Supper. Watch as Daniel Jolliffe explains what was happening at the Christian church at Corinth. Taking communion became a social event instead of a spiritual one. This lesson will leave you asking the question, what is on my mind when I take communion? Please like and subscribe to our channel. Blessing to you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us once again as we walk through the letter of 1 Corinthians. Some fascinating uh, cultural insights as well as theological insights as uh, as theology and culture collide. And today is no different. We're going to be discussing the Lord's Supper and what was going on in Corinth that would cause Paul to say, you're not taking the Lord's Supper. And so it's a pretty interesting study. Let's get into it, because this is central to to our Christian faith. Our our Sunday's assemblies uh, throughout church history have centered around the Lord's Supper. So it's a rather important subject. Let's get into the text. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. And I need, you need to remember, last week we were talking about head coverings, and Paul starts out by saying, I commend you for following my instructions on this particular subject. And so as he moves into this next subject, he starts out with, on this subject, I cannot commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry. Another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back. Whoever, therefore, eats and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. For when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the rest of the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give you directions when I come. Now, this is a really interesting passage, and it does reflect what's going on in the culture. And we need to talk about that a little bit to understand this section better. Dinner parties were not new to the first century Corinthians. And in fact, if you were followed along in this study, in the beginning, there were factions among different groups because of who they followed, the different teachers they followed. Now, it was quite common 
among first century Corinthians to find philosophers or orators, storytellers, and invite them to their homes to stay with them. The wealthy would, would invite them to their homes and invite their friends over for dinner. And they would serve food and wine. Many would bring their own as well. And they would also allow, you know, the servants and other slaves to stand on the outer edges, maybe at the entrance by the gate, to also listen in. But they didn't, they weren't served any food or drink. And so they, they were quite used to having these kinds of dinner parties. This was a, a custom. You have to remember they had no television or radio. This was their evening entertainment was to uh, go to some wealthy Corinthian's house who had uh, basically become a patron of some philosopher. They would often pay these guys a stipend. They would buy them new clothes as long as they stayed with them and provide them with food and a, and a bed to sleep in. This was common practice. And we read from that time period, their own philosophers and contemporary writers would talk about these dinner parties and the excesses of food and wine that were consumed and the classism. They even commented on the fact that while these wealthy sat around the inner courtyard uh, eating and drinking and getting drunk, the poor and the slaves and the servants stood on the outside only able to watch the eating and the drinking as well as listen to the entertainment. And so you can see if that was a common cultural practice, that when the church came together, quite possibly in the evening, since most people had to work during the day, that they came together in the evening and, and the church worship mimicked their dinner parties. That's not a big stretch when you, when you read about these dinner parties and you read about what's happening in the church. The, the early church communion was, in fact, a meal. And uh, they would invite their friends. And it makes sense that the wealthy could show up early because they didn't have jobs they had to attend to. And then the poorer Christians who had to finish their work day would show up later. And by then, the wealthier ones had already ate and drank everything. And the poorer ones would go hungry. That's the, the scene that Paul describes in this first century Corinthian church worship service. You see these divisions at the beginning were surrounding the teachers they rallied to. But, but in this case, in, in this chapter, he seems to be dealing with a classist division, a, a division between the rich and the poor, and one that everyone ex seemed to accept. But it, Paul makes sure it's clear that's not Christian. It might be Corinthian, it might be uh, culture, but it's not Christian. Um, it must have been quite a shock when Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, what you're doing is not the Lord's Supper. Because I'm sure they thought it was. And uh, so Paul writes this. This is one of the harshest statements made in the, in the New Testament when he says, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper. What are the theological applications of this? You see, the church at Corinth thought they were taking the Lord's Supper. It must have been a shock when Paul said they weren't. They were using the right words. They were using the right emblems, but the wrong spirit. You see, Paul says that when Christians maintain divisions amongst themselves, when they, when they actually let the sun go down on their anger, which he tells them not to do in the Ephesian letter. When he, they allow broken relationships to remain broken with no attempt at reconciliation. Um, while they're taking the Lord's Supper, if they actually maintain these divisions and, and they ignore them, and in fact they're insensitive to the needs of other members of the congregation, the poor, well then the Lord's Supper ceases to be the Lord's Supper for those Christians. It, it, it's, it's a symbol of our relationship with God and with each other. And so the idea that we can take the Lord's Supper like we're all happily communing together while you maintain divisions and broken relationships, while you maintain classist divisions between the rich and the poor, then, then the Lord's Supper is not actually symbolizing what it's supposed to. 
And God takes those symbols of his relationship with his people very, very seriously. And it's really easy for us to think that the, that the Lord's Supper is sort of a, an individualistic thing between us and God, but it's not. It's about God and us and the other believers, the other members of the body of Christ. And in fact, it's not a neutral thing. You see, when, when we proclaim divisions, instead of unity, God's wrath is called down upon us. When we actually make a mockery of the Lord's Supper by, by actually treating each other in ungodly ways while proclaiming we have fellowship and unity in God, the, 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 it brings down God's wrath instead of God's grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Paul lets them know that's why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Now, I think this is interesting. This verse, um, most Western commentators say they think this was metaphoric. Uh, most Eastern commentators say, no, this is real. That, in fact, there were people getting sick and some dying because of the bad manner in which they were taking the Lord's Supper, the mockery that they were making of it. And there's societies, I worked in Kenya, these, there's societies that take this verse very, very seriously. In fact, so seriously, they're so concerned about taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner and perhaps calling God's wrath down that they just don't take it at all. They, they, you know, they, their, their approach is better safe than sorry. And, and, and I, I want to talk about that because that's not what this means. This isn't telling us don't take the Lord's Supper. It's saying, make sure you're taking it in the right way. But Paul lays a heavy warning on them. He talks about discerning the body. And we need to understand what that means. That's critical. He says, if, you, if you're not discerning the body, if you're taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, it's because you're not discerning the body of Christ. What does that mean? Well, the traditional response has always been that while we're taking communion, we're supposed to meditate on the the image of Jesus on the cross. And we're supposed to meditate on his sacrifice, the shedding of his blood for our sins. That's the traditional uh, interpretation of this passage. But if you really look at the context, if you really look at the passage itself, it demands a different, another interpretation. And I want to be clear there, I don't think there's anything wrong with meditating on Jesus on the cross and his sacrifice for us. I'm just saying that that's not what Paul means in this passage. He says, so then, my brothers, at the very end, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. When Paul says discerning the body of Christ, he's talking about the church, the members of the congregation, not just the body of Christ on the cross. And so we need to understand, because it's rather important in this passage, of what, what does it mean to discern the body of Christ? He's talking about the other church members. And that's something we all need to consider. Often we've approached the Lord's Supper as if it's an individualistic thing, just between me and God and, and our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and again, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but in this passage, it's about the whole body. It's about our relationship with each other, not just our relationship with God. But we have Paul who, who lays this out really clearly. He says, this is what Jesus told us. This is what I passed on to you. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after the supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, that, that the whole idea of the Lord's Supper is to remember Jesus. Um, and, and again, there's been conflicts between the Catholic Church, the Protestant churches, over what, what's involved in that. You have the Catholic churches that believe in transubstantiation, that they think the, the bread and the, and the grape juice actually become the body and blood of Jesus as you take it. You have consubstantiation, which was Martin Luther saying, no, it doesn't actually become the 
physical body and blood of Jesus, but that the presence of Jesus is there. And then you had the, the Swiss reform guy, Zwingli. He said, no, 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 it's just a memorial service. Uh, that there's no nothing mystical about it. It's simply to remember Jesus. And you can see why they would think this in this passage. But Paul apparently thinks there's something more going on here. The purpose of the supper is to remember Jesus indeed, but to remember all of his ministry, to remember all of his teaching, to remember his relationship with God, his time spent in prayer, and, of course, the death, burial, and resurrection. It's not just a memorial, but it's a time to, to actually be transformed by the presence of God around his table. So where's the passage? Where's the gospel in this passage? Well, it should be very obvious. We're talking about the very center of the gospel. The Lord's Supper is a unity meal, proclaiming to all sinners that we are saved sinners by the blood of Jesus Christ, that, that there's a way out. We take communion on a weekly basis to remind ourselves and the world around us that we are not lost in our sin if we accept the blood of Jesus Christ. There is a way out, and Jesus has provided it. The purpose of the supper is not just to remember Jesus, I was just talking about this, but to be impacted by him, to be, to be transformed by meditating on all that he has done for us. Paul, Paul's very clearly saying in this passage, if, if you're taking the Lord's Supper correctly, you would be waiting and taking care of the poor in your midst. You wouldn't, you wouldn't openly eat while they're starving. You would, wouldn't get drunk before they even arrive for communion. You're, you're, you're doing it wrong because you're not considering the body. So apparently the, the participation in the Lord's Supper is supposed to be a transforming experience that impacts us, that changes us into more and more Christ-likeness, that that's the purpose. It's not simply a memorial, that we're actually joining in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as we gather around the table of God. I mean, that's a, it's, it's an incredible thought. It is a mystical thought. There's something more than just our physical gathering and taking of the, the bread and, the, and the, the grape juice and, some, and wine in some cases. That, no, we're actually participating in the presence of God, that God is among us and that he's watching us. Are we treating each other properly? Are we discerning the body of Christ? And so I want to be really clear about this when we talk about the unworthy manner. Uh, some people kind of think that that means, well, we have to be sinless. We have to be completely sinless in order to take it in a worthy manner. No, that we're actually taking it because we are sinners. We're taking it because we have fallen short of the glory of God. And that it is only through participating in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that we can be saved and that we need to be reminded of that. So, so the fact that we, are, we still struggle with temptations and sin is not a good reason to refuse taking the Lord's Supper. What is the unworthy manner, at least according to this text, is that when we have divisions among ourselves, if we are living with broken relationships, if we are holding bitterness towards a fellow brother and sister in Christ, and, and, and you know it, and you're not doing anything about it, and you continue to take the Lord's Supper, which says, oh, I'm one with God and, and all of my brothers and sisters, when that's not true, there's the problem. When the fellowship has been broken, when there's a division among you, that's an unworthy time to take communion. You know, 1 John tells us, you cannot say, I love God and hate your brother. We need to remember that, that, that if you've got a division, if, if there's a broken relationship that you can do something about, and I understand that there's free will on both sides, and, and sometimes people aren't willing to, to make amends or to, to even accept apologies, but, but we are all called to do what we can to mend those broken relationships, to let God transform the broken relationship. And then we can take the Lord's Supper in peace knowing we are one with God and one with our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the whole point of the Lord's Supper, to proclaim our unity with God 
and to proclaim salvation to the world so that people will know they can join in the presence and the fellowship of God and his people. Take that thought with you as you go out this week and try to proclaim the Lord's death in your own life and in your own words and certainly in your own church when you take the Lord's Supper. Thank you for joining us.